Hello, everyone. I'm Kyle Gerald, and I have the privilege of being the pastor of Countryside Free Methodist Church in Sandusky, Michigan. The message you are about to hear was previously recorded. If you'd like to catch one of our services in action, we'd love to have you stop by for either our 945 or 11 a.m. service, or check it out on our Facebook page at Countryside Free Methodist Church. God bless you, and thank you for listening. Open your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 5. And before I go further, I want to also remind you that we do have new devotional materials for you out there in the lobby. Uh, There are the Daily Bread devotionals out there, as well as our D6 Fusion devotional materials for you. And those all start at the 1st of September, which is this week. So we want to make sure that you have those in hand uh, as we turn the page into a new month this coming week. I also want to give you a heads up in case you uh, were here at the beginning, I mean, before the service and right up close to 11 o'clock time, and just letting you know that we're going to be covering a little more ground in Scripture today than we normally do. Um, So buckle up. Um, That means that, you know, I've been, I've been banking some extra minutes over the last few weeks by getting you out of here early, you know, before like the hour time. So I'm probably going to be cashing in some of those this morning, all right? So I was, I was tempted to jump over the last part of Ephesians chapter 5, which is where we we ended up somewhere in the middle last week, and jump straight to like the second half of Ephesians chapter 6 today, because that that section is all about gearing up, that last half of chapter 6. But as I started reading through and thinking and praying about this message on purposeful living, which is where we've been for the last several weeks, I quickly realized that those verses in between, end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6, are very connected with our overarching theme today. You see, the only reason that you would need to gear up is if you were facing a serious challenge or a competition. And, you know, athletes of, of all skill levels gear up as they prepare to compete. If you think about a professional football player, I don't even know, you guys, how many, how many different pads and, and pieces of gear they got on when they go out there on the field. But it's a lot, right? They got the pads. They got their helmets. They got special shoes. They just got the, the works going on. <clears throat> and, and even in sports without all those protective pads, like basketball or, or running, the athletes still gear up with special equipment, and you notice probably that the more serious the athlete, the more serious their equipment is, right? Special shoes, and they've got uniforms, or or special running wear, anything they can do to help them compete at the highest level possible. Well, the reason that we need gear is not because we're going into a, a professional athletic challenge, but because we're facing something even more serious, a battle. We are in the midst of a cosmic battle raging all around us every day for the heart and soul of every person you know. And today, as we walk through these final pages of Ephesians chapter 5, I'd like to highlight two of the battlefronts that we face, as well as our battle gear that we are to use in facing those battles. So let's start with battlefront number one, our home. Pick up the scripture reading with me this morning, beginning with Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. God's word says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and they care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So our first battlefront is our home. And my guess is that some people's blood pressure started ticking up 
as I started to read this passage or as you started to hear it. And I'll, I'll tell you what, mine did as I started thinking about preparing this message on this passage this past week, all right? Now, why is that? It's because our enemy, the devil, has done just a fantastic job of making the home a battlefront. Allow me for just a few minutes, though to take you back to the days and the circumstances in which Paul was writing these words that tend to bristle so many people here in 2022. In the Jewish community of Paul's day, wives, wives were considered the property of their husbands with little to no rights whatsoever. And according to Moses' writing in Deuteronomy, a Jewish man could divorce his wife Moses said, who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house. So, but there, there really was no reciprocal provision in Scripture given for women who were married. So by the time of Jesus, many teachers in the Jewish community would say that a man could lawfully divorce his wife if she but merely prepared his, his meal poorly. If she overcooked his food, his dinner, or oversalted it, he could write her a certificate of divorce. Or if he just found somebody more attractive, he could write her a certificate of divorce and send her away. In fact, at the time of Paul's writing of this letter, many of the Jewish girls were rethinking the whole idea of the marriage path because of all of that instability. And they were thinking maybe it would be better to just remain unmarried. And in the Greek community, where Ephesus was, things were even worse. Infidelity was the norm for Greek men. In the Greek culture, um, wives were secluded in the family's home, and they were intentionally kept from public interaction and, and, and the public's eye. Their main role was to take care of the home and to raise the family's legitimate children while the husbands could come and go as they pleased and even seek out the company of any other women or prostitutes whenever they wanted to. And in Rome, it was even worse. Divorce, remarriage, and adultery were commonplace. Uh, the early Christian priest, Jerome, even declared that he knew of a woman in Rome who was married to her 23rd husband, and she was his 21st wife. Guys, things were in bad shape. As far as marriage was concerned in Paul's days, the marriage institute was in serious trouble. And Paul's concept, though, of Christian marriage was revolutionary because it elevated the value and the role of women from being property to bring, being partners and returning marriage from this place of chaos to the beautiful covenant that God intended it to be. That's some of the history. So let's fast forward to today, okay? According to the Barna Group, which is a research group here in the U.S., among adults in our country who have been married, 33% have experienced at least one divorce. Think about that. Of all the people who've been married, 33% of them have experienced at least one divorce. So the situation for marriage and the family here in our own country today is not in much better shape, if at all, than it was in Paul's day. So many people are thinking these days, maybe I should just stay unmarried. Maybe it's not worth the trouble. Now, I know because of how Satan has been working overtime to mess with God's institution of the family, that some people who are going to hear this message are going to be tripping up over one word in particular in that passage that we just read. And, and as they do so, they're going to be in danger of missing out on the glorious bigger picture that God has for us in marriage. And that one word, of course, is submit. And the harsh reality is, folks, that people, especially men for thousands of years now, have often used the first part of verse 22, wives, submit to your husbands, as a sort of club to, to beat their wives into submission, to put them in their place, so to speak. But I want you to notice all of the things that Paul says in this passage. I want you to hear them, hear his, his take on that word as well as some of these other truths in here. First, notice with me, back up one verse from verse 22, back to the one I started with, verse 21, where he said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that in the Greek, when Paul said submit to one another, he actually meant submit to one another. 
right? That's how he starts off this difficult, challenging passage. Paul was speaking there to all believers, not to any one group in particular. And I'm pretty sure that that statement right there takes all of the pride and ego right out of the picture by saying, listen, we all need to approach in humility those we are in close relationship with in the body of Christ, okay? If a believer doesn't humbly listen to their brother or sister in Christ, no matter what their age, if they're not humbly listening to them, carefully taking in what they're saying, that person who's not listening is a fool. I mean, the church should be full of people who are looking to serve each other in whatever way they can, not full of people who are insisting on their own way. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let me ask you this question this morning. Have you or have you not committed your lives completely to Christ? Take a moment. Ponder that one for a moment. Okay, have you committed your life, submitted it completely to Christ? Or are you in the precarious position of insisting that you live your life, or at least parts of your life, your own way? Because if that's where you're at, I've got some tough news for you. You haven't yet fully submitted your whole life to Christ, have you? Now, perhaps you're concerned that if you give over a certain area of your life to Christ, he might want to make some changes in that area. Or perhaps you've just grown accustomed to having one or both hands on the wheel of your life, and you kind of like being in control rather than allowing Christ to be the one in control of your life. I'm not even talking about our relationships with other people yet. Right now, just talking about us and Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In Paul's mind, submitting our lives to the Lord is step one. If we're not fully committed, fully submitted to Christ, we will never know the fullness and the joy of that relationship until we are. And once you have that matter, that relationship resolved before God, then we can have a serious discussion about these next couple paragraphs that we just read through. But until then, as long as you are keeping one or both hands on the wheel of your life, these other passages aren't going to make a whole lot of sense. However, let's assume for a moment that we're all fully committed, fully submitted to Christ. Let's have a serious discussion then on wives submitting to their husbands as they do to Christ. And the flip side of that coin, which is husbands loving their wives as Christ loves the church. And folks, they are two sides of the same coin. And they were intended to forever be fused together. If the two sides, husband and wife, are fully committed to the Lord and fully committed to doing their part, then marriage is a beautiful thing. But if not, it gets ugly really quick. And here's why. Let's start with you guys, husbands. The example Paul gives for us, the place where he sets the bar, is the way that Christ loved the church. That's the mark we are trying to reach, loving our wives the way Christ loved the church. And if that thought, that level of love doesn't leave you guys quaking in your shoes every time you think about it, buddy, there is something wrong with you. I'm just saying, if the husband is loving his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, then he's going to be doing everything within his power to make sure she is cared for, protected, and loved, even at the expense of his own interests, his own health, and even his own safety. Folks, because that's what Jesus did. He served and he sacrificed in love on our behalf. That's the husband's side of the coin. However, if the husband's not loving his wife as Christ loved the church, then he's going to instead be thinking of himself and his own selfish interests. And rather than demonstrating that Christ-level sacrificial love for his wife, instead he's only going to be able to offer the human level of love, which is far inferior and is often pointed inwards towards the self. 
And husbands, let me just throw this out there. Not only are you to love your wives just as Christ loved the church, but Paul also said back there in verse 21 that you are also to submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. So I think if you take the whole passage into consideration here, you're going to see husbands, you actually have a double dose of responsibility. Submit and love like Jesus loved, which is serve and sacrifice as well. All right, let's flip the coin over. On the other side, ladies, the wife's side, Paul says, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. And that as you do to the Lord is the bar, your goal. The wife who does so is going to do her best to care for her husband with the same love she has for her Lord. And if she isn't submitting as she does to the Lord, then she's going to be also demanding her own way, thinking of her own interest, and is going to create tension and conflict within that husband-wife relationship. So in short, a, a balanced marriage where both the husband and the wife have first fully submitted themselves to Christ, secondly, fully committed themselves to each other with all their hearts. And if in a balanced relationship like that, neither side of the coin will be a burden, but rather a joy. But the trouble comes, right, when there is an imbalance, either in faith or commitment. If one or both spouses are not fully committed to Christ or not fully trusting in the other person, that relationship is quickly going to spiral out of control. People are going to start grabbing for their own self-interest, grabbing whatever they can out of that relationship and putting up walls to defend themselves and to keep themselves safe. In this passage also, I just want to note that Paul is really talking as much, if not more, about the relationship between Christ and the church as he is about husbands and wives. Did you see that as we were reading through it? Several mentions of Christ and the church in there. I mean, he lays out the whole passage on husbands and wives, and he ends up with these two lines. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, he says, but I am talking about Christ and the church. These two parallel tracks. One track is a husband and wife relationship, and the other track is the relationship between Christ and the church. And so when Paul says, wives, submit to your husbands, he meant that, but he also meant churches. You need to be submitting yourself to your husband who is Christ with all you have. You need to be keeping that in mind because he, as the husband of the church, has done everything. Everything possible to win your heart, your affection, and eternity for you. All right, let's turn the page to Ephesians chapter 6. Paul continues, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. <clears throat> any kids in the room? We have any kids in the room? Okay. I saw two hands, two hands go up. Shame on the rest of you. You're all children of somebody, all right? Um, but, so for all kids of all ages, you know, listening in, Paul is giving us two huge instructions. Obey your parents and honor them. Obviously, the o obedience one is a whole lot more for the younger kids that are still at home, okay? But honoring them is for everyone. Because the truth is, it is possible to obey your parents without honoring them, right? I know a lot of people who do that, who's, who obey their parents, live in that kind of relationship at that level. It's like they just do the bare minimum to squeak by and make sure that they don't get whatever consequence is, right? <laughs> That's where they're living. But it's impossible to honor your parents without also obeying them and your younger people. And my question is this. As Christian and Christian parents... We are often quick to raise the children obey your parents banner, but we also need to be just as quick to raise the honor your father and mother banner as well, even where our parents are included. And folks, I got a long way to go still. I'll just be honest with you on that. I know that. I know I got a long way to go even honoring my own parents. How do we do that? By making sure that we are staying in tune and staying connected with them, you know, being, being involved in part of their lives and looking for their needs and interests as well, spiritually and physically, all the way around. So, so keep those thoughts in mind, Paul said. 
Children, honor your parents. Honor your father and your mother. He goes on to say, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Guess what, guys? It sounds like Paul is hitting on you, you on the head a little bit here this morning because he kind of is, all right? So fathers, Paul has another word for you. He didn't mention moms here probably because God wired them up with such an incredible mothering instinct to nurture their children as they're growing and stuff. But men, on the other hand, we tend to be problem solvers, don't we? So when we see our children doing an activity, whether it's a chore or a sporting activity or a music activity, uh, oftentimes we are thinking about how we can help them do that a little bit better, aren't we? It's like, cause as soon as they're done talking to it, it's like, let's go, let me go over a few points with you, okay? Help you do this better next time. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting our kids to do better. That's a good thing. But if that's where we jump every time, when we're watching our kids in the, in the activities that we do, and that's the first thing they hear coming out of our mouths, guys, that's going to be very discouraging for the child. You know, when Paul wrote this passage to the Ephesians, he was writing again from within the middle of the Roman Empire, where this idea of the, the patria potestis was a very prevalent thought. And basically, translation, that is the power of the father. Because in the Roman Empire, the father's rights over his children were absolute, which means they extended as long as the father was alive, regardless of how old the child was. So if your father's 100 and you're 80, guess what? He still has absolute authority over you in any decision whatsoever, including whether or not you get to keep your life. He had power over your life even. So that was the culture that Paul was writing in. And so you can, you can imagine how frustrating it would be for a child living under the thumb of a father who was just totally domineering and didn't care a hoot about his child's well-being. But when Jesus came through his life and death and resurrection, he made it possible for all people to enter into God's family. So no longer were children to be treated as property or servants. Now they were to be treated as equal heirs in God's kingdom. And so Paul is saying, fathers, make sure you are bringing up your children in the training and instruction of the Lord. You guys, Paul did an amazing thing in elevating the value and the worth of women and also of children in his, letter, in his letters to the Ephesians. Our first battlefront is at home. And it is a huge one because the enemy is looking constantly for a weakness within every person in your home. The battle is intense and it is incessant. We need some serious gear to help us deal with that battle. Our second battlefront is in the marketplace. Let's continue. Chapter 6, verse 5 says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. And with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. All right, I understand that we are not living in the same kind of environment that Paul was when he was writing this, where, there was, where slavery was so commonplace. Um, you need to understand, Paul was not endorsing or condoning slavery. He was simply writing from within the context of the Roman Empire, where he lived, where slavery was an everyday, everywhere occurrence. Within the Roman Empire, 10 to 15% of the population was involved in some form of slavery. Okay, they, were, they were some form of slaves. And in the capital of Rome, about 30% of the people in the capital were slaves. So putting that context just over to the side just a little bit for a moment, I'm going to go out here on a limb, but I think it's a pretty sturdy limb. Okay? If, if the instructions that Paul was giving to slaves and their masters in that context, if, if there's truth in those instructions in that context, do you suppose there might be some truth for us here today 
in the much lighter context of employees and employers. I'm going to read this passage to you again and just change two words, all right? Just, just kind of a theoretical, putting it out there. But let's do it this way. So do you think God wants employees to obey your earthly employers with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ? And do you think God wants, for those of us who are employees, to obey them, not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but also as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart? And do you suppose God wants employees to serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do? Folks, I look at those things, and I think those all look like things that my Lord would expect from me and want for each of those who are employees. How many people do you know who are serving their employers that way these days? From what I see and hear, an employee who fits that description, who is doing those things, is pretty much on the endangered species list these days. And when somebody finds someone like that, they do everything they can to hold on to them, right? Because they are worth their weight in gold. If you can find an employee who works like that. And those who are in the position of employers, do you suppose God wants employers to treat your employees in the same way? Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Again, I might be going out on a little bit of a limb here, but I think that all of those main market pl- marketplace truths apply to us today. But there's a battle going on in our world today, isn't there? In the marketplace. And all around us, we have people asking themselves these days, what is the littlest effort I can give to get the greatest return? Or what can they do or not do while working and still get away with it? Whether you're employee or employer, right? What can you get away with without getting caught, without getting busted for it? Folks, our second battlefront is the marketplace. The enemy would have us looking out for ourselves no matter what it costs, rather than fixing our eyes on Christ, on the one who set us the example. He would have us, the enemy would have us looking our own, for our own interest, even if we have to bend rules or laws to do so. So that requires, again, some serious battle gear to confront these battles. So let's talk a little bit this, this morning about our battle gear. Paul continues, finally, he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So we need to recognize the fact that our toughest Everyday battles are going to be against these forces that Paul just mentioned. Those ones that are working in the realm that is hidden, in that cosmic battlefield. But they overlap into our homes, in our marketplace. They affect those areas. So we need some tools, some special gear as we go out into those battles. Paul continues, verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Folks, there's only one set of gear that's going to meet the need, and that is the full armor of God. And Paul, in these next few verses, is going to give us six pieces of equipment that mirror the equipment that the the Roman soldiers of his day would have used. And then he's going to throw in one bonus there, too. So let's hit them here really quick. Verse 14, he says, Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Of course, the, the belt of the Roman soldier held his, not only his garment in, in place, but a, a number of other pieces of his gear, including some of his weapons. So it was an essential part of his whole outfit. Truth ultimately comes from God, and it holds us together. His truth comes us together. And you guys, there are so many people in this world these days that think they can grab whatever belief they want to and adopt it as the, their, their one final truth. But truth only comes from God, and it holds everything else together. Secondly, Paul goes on, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. The breastplate protected the soldier's chest and vital organs, and righteousness 
grows in us and protects our vital spirit as we turn from our sins and we turn towards Christ. We got to have that peace in place. Verse 15, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Some translations say the shoes of peace. And shoes are designed to do what? To protect your feet as you, especially as you leave your home, right? The gospel is designed to go with us wherever we go out into the world, whether it's leaving our home or wherever we go into the marketplace. Our feet should be ready. Our hearts and minds should be ready with the gospel. Verse 16, he says, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I don't know about you guys, but if somebody is going to be shooting flaming arrows at me, I want a a, a piece of equipment that's going to help that, you know, either deflect or completely douse those things or just, you know, stick them without hurting me on the other side, right? And I don't know if you've ever seen those the Roman soldier shields, but they weren't these little bitty circles that, you know, you see in some movies and stuff that, some, that barely cover the guy's arm, right? The Roman soldier's shield were huge. They were like four feet tall and two and a half feet wide. Soldier could completely hide behind that thing if he needed to. You guys, that's what our faith should be doing for us. Okay, our faith in Christ. It should be a wall for us when we need it to be. And if, guess what? If your faith is weak, some of those arrows, some of those lies of the enemy are going to get through. Okay, but if it's strong, you got nothing to worry about because you're going to be able to stand strong against those attacks. Paul continues, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. A helmet obviously protects your head, which you got to have, you know, if you're going to get out of the battle, right? Um, so you have to keep your head. So you have to, you know, the helmet's a very important piece and you have to have salvation, which is to be saved from your sins by Jesus. That's what salvation means. You can't do it on your own. You have to have him with you to make it out of the battle. And also the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In Paul's analogy of the soldier's armor, he mentions these five defensive pieces of equipment, but he only mentions one that's used for the offensive, and that's God's word. Using God's word, applying it to our lives will send the enemy running. But folks, you can't apply, you can't use in battle what you don't know. All right, so read it, study it, memorize it, and please use it and share it as you go out. God's word. Finally, he includes one piece of bonus gear, pray. He says, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And he even says, implores them, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So if we were to continue Paul's little armor motif, prayer would be that hotline back to the general, the way that we would call him up and let him know we need some additional reinforcements here, either at my position or at my friend's position, right? Folks, when we step out of bed for the day, we get ourselves in trouble if we don't make sure our armor is all in place and ready to go. Now, I'm not saying that you need to spend an hour in devotions, you know, right as soon as you get out of bed, okay? Because I know that different people, you know, operate in different ways and they have their, their time with God, you know, at different times of the day. But I am saying, that, do a quick check, three to five seconds. God, how am I doing? Am I, you know, will you please go with me on this day? Make sure I keep my armor in place. Face the day like that so that the enemy doesn't surprise you and take you out early on in the day. You guys, I want you to think about just for a second. If a, if a professional football player lined up for the play on the line without his helmet on, or a baseball player stepped up to the plate without his bat, not good, right? Not smart. And in the same way, we are going to be in trouble right away if we step foot out into the world without our armor in place. We should all be training and disciplining ourselves to pause at least long enough to touch base with God and do a quick armor assessment. Church, it's time to gear up. And here, let me give you three quick ways to start doing that. Number one, humbly repent. If you've been living your life your way rather than God's way, repent before him of that. 
Number two, seek his help, polishing and improving your spiritual armor. Okay, keeping it, keeping it fresh, keeping it sharp, keeping it polished before the Lord. And number three, pray. Pray for his help in the battle for the church and for yourself. And we are actually going to close out that way. And I'm going to um, ask my, my friends on the worship team to come up. They're going to close us out in a, in, a, in a song after we pray. Uh, but before I pray, let me just say this. Folks, we are on the front edge of a new school year. Okay, this is a time when a lot of things are starting brand new in our homes, in our schools, in our community. And I want to invite you all as a follow-up to what we're talking about here today, to a special time of prayer this coming Wednesday night at 7 p.m., right back here at Countryside. We're going to do a prayer walk around either the parking lot or the property or both. You might, you, God might t- tell you to do one or the other, but it just we're going to pray. We're going to pray for each other. We're going to pray for our church. We're going to pray for our community. And I want you to invite you to come and join us on that prayer walk Sunday, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Even if you are not up to getting out of your vehicle and actually doing the walk part, come and park and pray with us. Okay, we would love to have you do that um, because, again, that is a, a vital part of this whole process. Let's pray as we wrap up today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time in your word. God, we humbly recognize that we are involved in a battle and we don't often see the immediate effects of that, God, but they are there and they are real. And God, we want to be prepared. So I pray that you would help each of us to gear up in the days ahead, put on our our spiritual armor and walk in a way that is pleasing to you. God, I pray that you would strengthen us, empower us to take the battle to the enemy's doorstep, take back ground for your kingdom, God. We love you so much. We pray all this in your precious holy name. Amen. Guys, thank you so much. Have a great week. God bless you.